What's up guys, Saf here on Super Saf Speaks and welcome to episode number 20 of the podcast with myself, your host Super Saf. And your co-host Thunder E from Border Work. And in today's episode, there's there's a lot to cover. We've actually got some new gear for the podcast, which we can talk about. And then there's some new Apple news. There's the Mac Mini M1X, which we've seen some very interesting looking renders and leaks. The new 16-inch MacBook Pro, which everybody's been talking about. But there's also lots of social media news. Twitter is now oh, has reopened uh, verification verification requests. Uh, we have put forward a verification request for the SuperSaf Speaks Twitter handle, so we can talk a little bit about what that process involves. We'll see if we will get verified or not. WhatsApp is currently suing India <laughs> over privacy, <laughs> so that's something that's uh, it, it's quite definitely an interesting story there. Amazon has bought MGM for eight point four five billion dollars and. We've also got some information on Ford's new F-150 Lightning Pro EV. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about the equipment. So e, when I, when I started the podcast, I didn't really want to, you know, waste time looking for gear and things like that. So we started off with what we already had, right? So I had the Blue Yeti yeah. X, which honestly speaking, did a really good job to kind of kick things off and, you know, really appreciated that mic. But then, sure, um got in touch and they actually have sent out the Shaw MV7 mic, which can work with USB as well as XLR. So we both have that. I have the silver version and he has the black. I mean, maybe we need to do a switch, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can, you can, you can hear. And uh, the, we've actually had these for like, well, I've actually had mine for a couple of months, but we were waiting for ease to come through so we can both kind of switch over in sync and then you kind of have that consistency and you know exactly what they sound like. So definitely let us know. And we've also got the Shaw um, Ionic 50 uh, headphones that go along with it. So yeah, we are now fully converted over onto Shaw equipment. So a big shout out to Shaw for providing these and hopefully improving the quality of the podcast, which we are obviously keen to do, especially with episode number 20. Um, pretty pleased that we've yeah. uh, we've got to episode 20. So yeah, it's uh, it's been going good and we're still having lots of fun. So e, the first thing I want to talk about is um, some of these new Apple leaks with WWDC around the corner. There's a lot of these leaks heating up. So front page tech, John Prosser again, coming in with mm -hmm. those hot leaks, the Mac mini with the M1X. So it's rumored to have the M1X, which um, will have up to 64 gigabytes of RAM, a 10 core CPU with either 16 or 32 graphics cores. So, you know, it's really gonna be beef up there, beefed up there. And it also looks a lot sl slimmer compared to the current, because the current Mac mini kind of looks a lot like the previous Mac mini, it's just powered by the M1. Yeah. So now it looks, the, 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 the leaked, um, uh, from uh, and these are renders that we've got based on the uh, schematics very very slim and it's got a whole range of ports the first one which is the most interesting i think is that it's got the magnetic power cable and this is something that we've seen on the m1 um, imac which just kind of snaps yeah. on love it really really cool and it has four thunderbolt ports and uh it's got a glass top instead of metal so that's that's something else that's quite interesting so potentially will have different colors that you could have as well again this is a speculation at this point we're not sure exactly when it's going to come out but mac mini e i know uh you you mentioned your uh missus had uh the mac mini and, and, and did try that out yeah yeah um so she and mrs mini board fam uh she tried out the mac mini she actually did a video showing the setup of getting a mac mini or an imac and at least the old imac anyway mm. um and you could see the benefits. I like what I see with the new design. Uh, I because I, I expected the the M1 Mac Mini to be thinner, but I guess it made sense to just quickly release it with the same chassis. Um, and it's it's good to see that the at least the rumors for the M1X have more Thunderbolt ports, which was something um, Intel had alluded to that at least the M1 could not support multiple displays. 
with mm. Thunderbolt, and which is true, it just can't. I think the M1X solves that problem, which is why you can see more Thunderbolt support as well on there, uh, on the on the on the, on the um, on the chassis. I think overall it, it looks nice, um, and but I'm just I'm really curious though, um, and I think we talked about this early either in the earlier podcast or early in the year where we said Apple is trying to win this year literally trying to win this year. i mean it's they're doing uh, a good job <laughs> i will say that <clears throat> yeah exactly um from just announcements and launches and you know uh you know we've got we got the uh wwdc uh invite and you could see three people on three displays and um you know i'm guessing one is that a macbook uh six, MacBook 16 Pro, inch 16 MacBook inch Pro. and you know maybe at least the the uh the Mac Mini M1X, and maybe the iPad Pro, just to kind of bring that back where we'll see some software additives on there. But, I mean, it's exciting. Even though I'm not an Apple fan, but I'm excited about, like, how they've just been pushing stuff out. Uh, I mean, you're right. They have been kind of really heavy on pushing new things out this year and you know we just i just covered the ipad pro m1 last week as well as the um 2021 imac which has got a lot of attention and a lot of people very excited with those devices and yeah with the wwdc the latest um kind of invite that went out uh, does have some macbook pros there which kind of gives a hint of what we might see. So we do have some mm -hmm. um, information here from Mark Gurman on Bloomberg. Um, and it's um, it says that Apple does plan to launch the redesigned MacBook Pros in 14-inch, codename J314, and 16-inch, codename J316. I mean, those code names don't really matter, but I just thought I'd, I'd just put them out there. So we're, we're likely to have a redesigned chassis, um, a magnetic MagSafe charger. So this looks like an, uh, another direction that Apple's taking, just having that MagSafe connectivity across the board. Uh, more ports on the new M1X uh, MacBook Pro. So it's likely to also have it in an HDMI port as well as an SD card slot. Now, we've talked about this before, E, but I'm super excited about the SD card slot coming back. So, and it, and it all almost looks like a, you know, a, a U-turn from Apple because, you know, they went for this sort of very minimal ports, uh, you know, just, just USB-C. But if they're kind of bringing those back, I do like that new direction from Apple because it kind of says that, okay, we're, we're listening to what you guys want, you know, like they went back to the scissor switches and they are not like just kind of putting it out there and just get used to it sort of thing. So I do appreciate that for sure. I definitely like this idea of what Apple is doing this year um, because if they're bringing back the SD card slot, it means that they've at least acknowledged that they made a mistake. I know you're saying they listen to me, I call it they made a mistake, but it's the, it's the idea that at least they know that, hey, look, if you wanna win this year, which is what we're already doing, we should deliver the things that people want, right? Yep. Um, you know, even something like the iPad, uh, the iPad Pro, uh, mm. which is a very pro user uh, device. You throw the M1 in there, it now tells a pro, look, I know you didn't really ask for this, but this is what you want because it's it gives you more power, it gives you more performance, mm. gives you everything you need. Same thing with even even the Air Tags per se, right? Um, and with that, with that, just because I, I remember Danny just dropped a video this week, Danny Wingate, hmm. and I looked at that and I remember when Samsung made that announcement. This is, in, in, to me, I, Samsung made a really solid product, at least from his video too, but it's the way Apple delivered its own product out, and it was like, oh my god, I need AirTags, I need to, <laughs> I need to find my keys and stuff like that, you know, out there. So they, I think they're on a very smart roll this year, and I think. Uh, the execs and the design team is thinking better. Uh, maybe not so much with those white borders around the <laughs> iMac. <laughs> but well, I think it's it's really it's, it's to... funny because the those borders, like you know, it's so interesting to read the comments on my video because a lot of people actually like the borders. And one thing Dave Two D mentioned, which was quite interesting, was that what this device is kind of meant to be and it's like supposed to be the home it's not supposed to be for pro users um although you can get away with some some pro tasks uh, understandably it's supposed to be something that kind of sits in your home and most people's walls are white okay so or a very light color so then when you've got this you know that's sitting in in, in your living room where the background is also white then it actually you know 
blends in a little bit more compared to if it was black, depending on the content that you're viewing, of course, obviously, if you're watch, viewing black content. So it's it's quite interesting how there's been um, a bit of a, 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 a bit of a different um, view based on who it is. I look, I'm sorry. Sorry, Dave TD, man. I don't know you personally, but that's just too much overthinking. I, I, I can't buy it. I, I just call it I'll call it I'll call it an aesthetic choice the design team made. Mm-hmm. Me personally, I don't like that aesthetic choice. Uh, okay. I think be, just because um, TVs, especially in the home, TVs are also thinner borders, very picturesque. Um, and I think the home now is more picturesque. We're, we're especially with those uh, pastel colors yeah. that most people have at home. So, but, but again, you you, but. you think, and this is what I think, and this is what half the comments on my YouTube video think. But then the other half are like, actually, it looks really good, especially with the silver. So again, obviously, we don't speak for everybody collectively. Everybody, yes, it, yes I true. still I still true. go for black bezels, and and that's something that I said in my uh, video, and, and I and I would continue to say that you know for me, black bezels are what it should be, but. Hey, it, it, True. it is it is what it is. Each to their own. Now, um, the MacBook Pro. Going back to that, so it is likely to have the M1X, which uh, will have uh, eight high performance cores, two energy efficient cores. That will give it a total of ten, and it will have either sixteen or thirty two graphics cores. With sixty four gigabytes of memory versus currently the M1 uh, the current M1 can only do up to 16 gigabytes of RAM, right? So mm-hmm. with this, you will have the option of having, you know, way more RAM, which completely makes sense for the MacBook Pro. It's, I mean, some hints are suggesting that we might be seeing something at least of the MacBook Pros um, at WWDC. I do think that the M1 uh, MacBook, uh, sorry, the, 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 the Mac Mini uh, M1 will be at a later point because we've just seen... Um, the other one recently. So I think it's still yeah. early days for that. But the MacBook Pro 16 inch, I think is around the corner. So let's see. Yeah, um, I, see, I, I think that you, I think you're definitely right. Um, I think we're also gonna get the AirPods Pro um, at, uh, so the new AirPods 3 and the AirPods Pro 2 at uh, WWDC, just because they announced mm. lossless audio so recently. Yeah, um, and and there's nothing that can really play yet at all. No, but at this point, so. I mean, those still won't be able to do it wirelessly, will they? They still won't be able to play lossless wirelessly because the AirPods Max can't do that. Am I right in thinking that? I'm not an audio expert. Yeah, AirPods Max can't can't do that. Um, so I I, mean, I I would very much doubt that the AirPods Pro would be able to do that. The the second yeah, I mean. That. Yeah, the HomePod is going to get an update for it just because it's over Wi-Fi, which means you've got enough bandwidth to push whatever you want in terms mm-hmm. of lossless audio. But um, I'm, the AirPods Max one was a bit surprising because we all thought if you just plug it in, it should. Yeah, it doesn't. Do it. And obviously with the AirPods Pro, you can't plug them in regardless. So <laughs> if, you, if you can't have yeah. it on the AirPods Max, I would say that you wouldn't be getting it on the um, AirPods Pro, but let's see. I mean, WWDC is is, is around the corner. And obviously, once we've had the official announcements, we'll be doing some coverage here on the podcast. Okay, now moving on to some social media news, Um, Twitter verification. So they had paused verification requests for a very long time. And just last week, they dropped the news that um, they are relaunching. And uh, now you can, it's, it's actually being rolled out, so you might not have it on your profile yet, but you can basically go no, into your profile it. settings and then you can go into your account and then you can actually now apply for verification. So the first thing's first, right? Okay, who's, uh, who's eligible, right? So it says to qualify for verification, you must fit the criteria of one of the six categories listed below. So you've got government, companies, brands and organizations, news organizations and journalists, entertainment, sports and gaming, activists, organizers and other influential individuals, right? Now, here's the thing. What a lot of people kind of think is it's to do with followers. It's to do with how popular you are. And it's not anything to do with that. And verification has never been anything to do with that. It's what Twitter considers notable. So it's so funny because... I've I've had hundreds of messages over time with people with like literally three followers saying, oh, staff, can you help me get verified? And I'm like, why would Twitter even, you know, verify you? Not even based on your follower number, but like what, what notability do you have, right? The reason for verification is to kind of show that this is an official account. Obviously, there's lots of things like impersonation, which goes on, which I get 
freaking so often. There's so many people who, who mm-hmm. come on. Now, my Twitter profile has been verified for many years, thankfully, right? But they kind of stopped the verification request process. Hey, you've got it. Yeah. Have you applied? I, I'm about to. I, I just finally got it, like okay. now. Okay, so you I just tried got the earlier right today. Now. So it, 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 it rolls out. So I actually did it through the, to, to the Super Seth Speaks profile. So what you can do is you can go into the settings and then it asks you for a, for a few bits of information. If you've got, say, if there's uh, somebody's made a Wikipedia page for you, then, you know, you can just link them to that or you can link them to a few news articles, I believe it is. Again, just to kind of prove that you are verification worthy, right? So you have a few steps that you could do. So then I have put forward the SuperSaf Speak Twitter account because it is kind of essentially linked to me. I'm not sure if they are gonna verify it based on the fact that it's linked to me or on the based on the fact that is there anything independent purely about the podcast out there on notable news sources, right? I don't know how that works exactly, but We'll see, we'll see what happens. It is open. If you feel that you are eligible to be verified, you can go ahead, fill out this form. And apparently they get back to you within a few days. It can be a few weeks, depending on how busy it is. Uh, I'm assuming it's very busy right now because when I did get the initial option, when I went onto it, it actually didn't do anything. It just said, oh, sorry, um, try again later because we're, 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 there's just too many requests. Uh, and obviously that's that's expected after you've opened it up after three years. I think he's actually <laughs> in the process of applying right now. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm busy right now. Yeah, we'll find out if he actually gets verified or not, if it's actually really E or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's news, news coverage, wiki. I don't have a wiki. I'm not I'm as important as SAF, so that's, you know, it's a bummer. Yeah, but the, the, so, so the thing is, verification, I have to say, right, um, in my opinion, it really does help, right? Not only from the point of view where, you know, okay, it's not, it, it's not a, for me, it's not a popularity contest. It's like, oh yeah, look, that guy's verified, yeah. But it, it actually has a few positive effects. Firstly, if you know what the Twitter verification um, system works like, once you're verified, you actually get three separate tabs for your notifications, right? So you get all everything, which is just a mess. And uh, you know, when you're getting hundreds of tweets a day, it's very uh, difficult to actually keep up with that. Then you get your specific mentions. And then there's a third section, which is verified. And that just kind of categorizes all verified interactions. So to give you an example, if I want to reach out to somebody, so say there's somebody that I'm like, like, you know, I'd love to have this person on the podcast, for example, and I was to drop them a tweet, right? Chances are they're not going to see the tweet from a non-verified profile, especially if it's somebody that's, you know, quite popular or definitely quite notable, they probably won't see it. However, if I'm verified, they are much, much more likely to see that verification notification and much more likely to respond. And I found for me, that's been super helpful, whether that be, you know, just maybe tagging a brand for something or, you know, if there's something that somebody that I need to kind of reach out to, I can do that. And the verification really, really helps. The other thing that verification does is um, it helps people kind of differentiate whether it's a real or fake profile, but also it gives you a bit more sort of credibility that, okay, if this person is verified, then clearly they are somewhat notable. So, you know, people are more likely to follow that person as well. So I think I also noticed that as soon as I got verified on all these different platforms, uh, the following consistently uh, also increased. Yeah, I mean, that's that's very true. So I'm going to try and do that. And hopefully I get verified, but I need to find a category. So somebody write an article about me. It'd be great. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> you might you might you might be verified as the co-host of Super Seth Speaks. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be so. <laughs> oh, my life. <laughs> hey, man, as long as it gets you verified, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. More social media news. Um, so we've got WhatsApp in the news again. By the way, I still haven't accepted the WhatsApp privacy policy. <laughs> Have you, E? Um, I think I did. No, because my, my mom's on WhatsApp. and my mom, so It's a long story, but I, I just had to because she's, she's on there. Okay. But here's the thing. I'm still on there. I'm still using it as, as fine. I just keep ignoring the, no, the notification whenever it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still letting me carry on using WhatsApp as normal. It's just that I've not accepted it. But anyway, on the topic of privacy, um, WhatsApp uh, has uh, gone to court over India's privacy rules. Okay, so WhatsApp is suing the Indian government 
over new digital rules that will force the messaging service to violate privacy protections. It said rules that require tracing the origin of chats where the equivalent of keeping a fingerprint of every single message sent on the service, right? Mm -hmm. In February, the government introduced new guidelines to regulate content on social media and streaming platform. And India is WhatsApp's largest market with over 400 million users. Obviously, WhatsApp is hugely popular in India as lots of other yeah. things are. Now, the government's rules for social media have said that messaging platforms would need to make provisions for the identifications of the first originator of information, okay? Now, uh, the article kind of goes on, and this will also affect platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp. So it, it is going to be cross-platform. Obviously, Facebook is not just... Um, uh, it, WhatsApp is just not Facebook. It's also Instagram, right? Uh, yeah. So it does have a big impact. Now, there's a few things here. So, okay, I, the end-to-end -end encryption obviously is very, very important from WhatsApp's point of view, and that's the kind of um, privacy that you sign up for, right? And this is what the whole yeah. situation has been. Now, if they can kind of be able, if, if they're able to kind of give that information where it's able to track to the originator, now I kind of see where, where, where the government's coming from because if there is a, a piece of, false information or something that's been sent around they can kind of track it down but then that kind of goes against the whole privacy issue so it's it's a bit of a dilemma because you know you kind of see both sides of the argument to a certain extent and it's just like okay what is the solution here uh whatsapp is correct uh, end -to -end i encryption. that end-to-end -end encryption um because what what that means is the way the way mm -hmm. I, at least i remember how end-to-end -end encryption works is that if you're able to locate the first, then you can basically read the whole message and like everything that goes on with that conversation um, because you're looking at the originator and you can map down. So it not only means that, and I get the idea from the government, it, it's like, okay, there's false information, even if you say there's a terrorist group, whatever the group it is, right? You say there's a false information there, but doesn't mean that person... Uh, made the false information knowingly it might be you know have Copy seen and something paste. and shared it yeah right um and then are you going to now persecute everybody else who was on that chat as well uh you have all those people's info uh that's the that's where that problem lies and again um what about how does this affect chats outside india that comes into india you know just because it's yeah. something that has affected india Mm -hmm. Right, but it, the message originated somewhere else, like uh, I don't know uh, Armenia or something. Do you, is Indian government going to say, well, because it's affecting okay. us, we have to go out there through? So, so I, t I totally agree with you here, right? Because okay, so part of me kind of sees the side where it's just like, okay, if there is something that's happening which you need to track down, because let's be honest, right now, even online, you get some death threats, you get all of this stuff that you get. And you're yeah. like, okay, you would not say this to me in my face. And this is the thing with a lot of these um, trolls, keyboard warriors, they will say lots of illegal uh, and hurtful things and like, you know, you know, giving you lots of crazy threats and have nothing, no comeback, right? Okay. Yeah. So being, being able to have that control, but then it's like, okay, who are you giving that power to? Because let's be completely real here. You can't trust all governments. They may misuse that information. For example, we've had the perfect example um, recently. Um, uh, I don't want to get too controversial, but uh, the Indian government actually requested the removal of uh, a bunch of tweets, which were around the whole pandemic situation that's in India, which were criticizing the government, right? So they actually got uh, Twitter to kind of take these down, right? And Twitter kind of doesn't have a choice to they have to take those down because if they don't take them down, then India might just put a block on the whole app, which means it's a huge loss for everybody, right? Exactly. See, that that already tells me no. Yeah. If it, because even if you look at it this way, right? Um, when we had Trump as president, Trump didn't like certain tweets and he wanted to take it down, but the government never did. I'm mm -hmm. not saying the U.S. government is good or bad. I'm just saying that at least the government didn't take any participation fully in saying, <laughs> hey, uh, our president doesn't like these tweets, you know, take it down. I mean, there's so many tweets about even Vladimir Putin and he doesn't say anything. You know, yeah, uh, but, 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 but so. this is the thing. It's like when it, when it comes down to this, it's just like, yeah, sure. But then 
who has that power because if you have power. that power it also opens it up for misuse right so i yeah. mean i'm I'm also going to take the side of whatsapp here because it's just like it is all about enter and encryption and giving that power will mean 100 that it is going to be misused right and if if that is the case then you know it's best to keep it encrypted as it is but let's see how it all pans out because Again, I, I keep emphasizing this, but India is such a huge, huge market and you just can't ignore it, right? And you saw no. the impact that uh, TikTok had when India banned the app, right? It was the largest growing uh, app or, or location for that app, right? And then it just gets cut and, and there you go. And, and it's a huge, huge market. And then as we saw in the article, 400 million users um which is the largest user base of whatsapp is in india so you know if it was a case where that would have to be cut off that would have a huge impact so there, there, there's, there's a lot there so let's see how that pans out we'll be keeping up to date with that and we'll be keeping you guys up to date with it as well okay um now let's talk about amazon because M amazon has bought mgm this literally just dropped today. So mm -hmm. um, we've got an article here on The Verge. Amazon has reached a deal to acquire the film and TV company MGM for $8.45 billion. The company announced today, and uh, it's a significant acquisition for the e-commerce giant. Uh, it means it will own a library of content that's reported to consist of around 4,000 films and 1,700 hours of TV. The acquisition is likely to help Amazon attract even more big spending Prime subscribers as its Prime video service comp competes with the likes of Netflix and Disney+. Plus. So E, yep. I'm going to get your thoughts on this because obviously you're, 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 a, you're a man that's into entertainment. So um, what does this mean, this huge acquisition? This is, this is just, this is the second salvo in the Hollywood entertainment wars. That is that is about to just explode. Mm. Uh, this is huge. This is huge for Amazon because Amazon has been doing well. The pandemic has really shown that Amazon's numbers in terms of viewing has actually grown. Pardon the siren outside. Um, have, have, they, have, but, have they come to get you? <laughs> no. Was it Singala? <laughs> <laughs> no, Sing Singala's not here, guys. Sorry about okay. that. Um, but so. Amazon really grew during the pandemic because what, what happened through some of the stats that I've seen is that Netflix, of course, had the biggest jolt in the pandemic because they, they were, they've always been ready for streaming content. Um, and everybody else was looking for something. You know, Disney Plus grew because it's got a very large Disney library to keep the kids happy, things mm -hmm. like that. And then people realized, oh, I've got Amazon Video with Amazon Prime anyway. And they started catching up on all these different shows, movies. And Amazon has seen a big uptick. In the world. And the rumor actually for this has been circling for a while. There's a rumor that Amazon was looking, uh, Apple was looking to buy MGM last year and Apple didn't. And now Amazon has and Apple might actually buy. I think Apple might, might look to buy someone. Paramount is still available on the table. We also have word that... Um, uh, Warner Brothers, at least the Warner DC library, might be available, and this is a this is also a very weird um, <laughs> transaction because AT and T you should own it, you should own Warner Brothers. Uh, they spun it off and then merged it with Discovery, aka the Discovery Network, um, mm. and formed a new company which will be called. It's still not finalized. Discovery or Warner, Warner Discovery, whatever it's going to be called. Uh, and then Discovery paid AT and T forty five billion for that spin off. AT and T keeps seventy one percent of the stock, but Discovery controls it with twenty nine percent. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so once that happened, everyone went, "Oh, it's going to happen!" And this Amazon deal with MGM really sped up. It almost looked like they saw the news, and MGM was like, "We'll take that eight billion dollars that you're about to give us." And thank you very much. Go forward. You know, um, but it, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting because it, everyone's looking for content, looking for stuff out there to put yeah. up, and and I saw the recent numbers for all the streaming services. Uh, Netflix is at two hundred million. Um, Amazon is number two at a hundred and I think twenty or one hundred and thirty. Uh, uh, Disney Plus is at one hundred and ten. Then we have um, Apple TV at forty five, um, and. And then we also have um, HBO Max, which is at um, 41. And then we have uh, like a few other other services. Okay. So HBO is about to open up internationally. Apple TV is available worldwide. 
it's a race for who has content and everyone is going to buy content from somewhere so this is this is huge it's 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 such an interesting time and you know you mentioned the pandemic and i think that really did uh, obviously fuel this uh uh, content oh. hunger should we say and you know what, what i what i gotta say about amazon like it's just so because i i've been an amazon prime uh customer for many years but that's for the amazon prime delivery okay i have never like it before the pandemic i had amazon prime i had pretty much never logged into it okay because i never used to get time to watch tv so what i would use amazon for was for deliveries okay then the pandemic hit and I was like, oh, actually, I've got Amazon Prime. Like, let, let, let me see what, what, what we've got on Prime. And then I came across The Expanse and I was like, this is bloody brilliant. And just watched the whole, like, binged on it completely. We had other shows like The Boys, all right? Amazing, amazing show. And I'm like, okay, this is really cool because I'm not necessarily paying any more than I would have been because I'm already just paying for the uh, the convenience because I literally order so much stuff from Amazon on a daily basis. I mean, even this mic stand that I've got here was something <laughs> that I ordered like, you know, a couple of days ago and it just came the next day. And I was like, hey, now I can yeah. start using this mic, right? It's just so convenient. But then having that bundled in, I think is just genius from Amazon because that, you know, the numbers that you've got there, as I said, but it's, it's, it's not that they've got like bad content or anything. They actually have really good content on there. Exactly. And then once they've got MGM, then, you know, you've got Oof. the likes of Rocky, you've got some um, James Bond. James Bond, uh, yeah. There's, there's a whole selection of content and obviously all the TV shows as well that come across with it, which completely makes sense for Amazon. And, you know, I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see what some of these others do. And, you know, HBO Max uh, going global, because that's another thing as well. We've, we've talked about this before, where a lot of these uh, TV shows and movies come exclusively on HBO Max. And then we have to wait for them here in the UK. As soon as that goes yeah. international... Man's a signing yeah. up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and just to give you some of the numbers that are striking, Netflix came out and said they're going to spend, mind you, so they, Amazon bought um, MGM for $8.45 billion, right? Sounds like a lot of money. Netflix is spending $18 billion next year on original content. Wow. That is literally double the amount of what it costs to buy MGM. Um uh, Disney came out and said they're going to spend $16 billion on the original content next mm. year. Then uh, Discovery, who just you know merged with Warner Brothers, says they're going to spend $20 billion on content. And they started announcing things left and right. Uh, so we know that, and we also know that Amazon, Amazon is spending on a Lord of the Rings TV show. Lord of the Rings TV show. Three seasons. Oh, wow. They, are, they, they have a budget of half a billion dollars. Damn. Okay. So this is a, <laughs> it's it's looking fun. I mean, yeah. There's there's a lot of uh there's a lot of stuff that's coming up, and I mean, we all benefit as consumers, right? Obviously, you don't want to have twelve different subscriptions, <laughs> but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if there's if the content serves it, I mean, you know, you, you were talking about Netflix spending eighteen billion. I just saw um the Zack Snyder's um Army of the Dead recently, which was yeah. very high budget. How much was that? Like two hundred million. No, no, it wasn't like that. Was, it, wasn't it, was, it was pretty high, um, though. It was, it was high. high. No, it was it was a hundred and something. It wasn't two hundred. It was hundred and something, um, and they let him play. So we all know how Zack Snyder has kind of suffered with Warner Brothers, uh, with them editing his stuff and whatever. Netflix yeah. was like, "You want to make a zombie movie? Psh, here you go, buddy." <laughs> seventy to ninety million dollars. So not quite the 200 million that I said, but 70 to 90 million is still quite a lot of money, right? And it was a big budget movie. Personally, I did not think it was good. I'll just tell you that right now. I just thought mm -hmm. like, really? Um, yeah, what about you? Have you seen it yet? No, I, have, I haven't seen it yet. But okay. I mean, all zombie movies are, for me, the only one actually I did like was his very first zombie movie, uh, uh, The First Army of the Dead, where he did it. Dawn, Dawn of the Dead? My, Dawn of the Dead, yes, yes, I did like that. But in general, all zombie movies, I always think, take them as mindless because there's a lot of stupidity that happens in zombie movies. That's the Ex way I see Exactly. It. I'm not going to go into so, detail. No spoilers. Yeah. But man, like I, I did not enjoy the movie. I just thought it was a waste of however many hours that it was. And it was quite long as well. So yeah, okay. uh, I, I didn't enjoy it. But hey, it was 70 to $90 million and Netflix paid for it because they can. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. But um, 
very interesting space in the streaming wars and there's going to be lots more content coming up which is great all right the last last thing we're going to be covering today is ford's f-150 lightning pro so yeah that's Ford right. has revealed a version of its new f-150 lightning electric pickup which is aimed specifically at commercial customers it's called the f-150 lightning pro and it starts at just under forty thousand dollars and that's for a version with an estimated 230 miles of range and extended range versions of the truck, which are expected to give you around 300 miles on a full battery starts at just under $50,000. Now, this kind of looks like a more traditional pickup truck, unlike the Cybertruck, of course. Um, <laughs> what do you think of it, E? So the F-150 Lightning Pro is different from the F-150 Lightning. The reason why I really want to talk about this is first of all, this is the first car that has a pro model, just like a Galaxy S22 Ultra <laughs> Pro or whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's it's interesting. But when Ford made the announcement for the F1 F F150 Lightning uh, series, hmm. um, my buddy Warren said this is the end of Cybertruck, um, and I agree. I think that a lot of people <coughs> underestimate what the F-150 is to Ford, to the point where Ford, about four years ago, Ford stopped making regular cars. They sell SUVs, Mustang, F-150. F-150 made them $43 billion in sales mm. last year. So that is that is their big move here. And a lot of people talk about the range. It's 300 and and I, I, I'm okay with the range because the way Ford does its own thing with F-150s, they have a 250 and they have a 350 Super Duty. Those are the ones that, you know, all the contractors use, all the, the guys who use in, you know, for different type of contract work. And that probably would have the much, much higher range. But it looks like a truck, which is very appealing. And to its credit, they've hooked it up with so many things in terms of ports, connectors, that is more practical for those kind of users. Mm. And I think that's that's the more attractive part because I get it with the Cybertruck. We've, we've had this discussion in the past uh, where uh, Tesla had to show something a bit weird to literally get people's attention, right? And it's mm. like, here's this cool thing we've created. It's got all these different specs. Now, will they, will they deliver in time? We have to wait and see. This looks like a traditional truck. It looks like at least the chassis seems familiar. And then a couple of things they add. Like I, I saw a breakdown of a breakdown video where um, there is charging ports everywhere for your power tools, for your this, for your that, which is what a lot of people with those kind of trucks do. And yeah. then it can power your home for three days. Okay. So that this part is that, that, huge. Yeah, because you know we we, we had this whole situation uh, in Texas, right, where yeah people mm -hmm. were just having power cuts and stuff like that, and it's just like in a situation like that, especially if you do have solar panels, right, you, it's just brilliant because you charge your car up in the day and then you can live off the car overnight, right, right. and you're pretty yeah. much you just do not notice that power's gone. Essentially, you're just, you're just completely off the grid. I really do like the idea. I don't know why they, you know, I'm sure they'll be doing that on Tesla as well, where you can actually use your Tesla as a, oh, yeah. you know, as, yeah. as, a, as a power I, I, store. I, I definitely think, I, th I definitely think the Cybertruck, maybe not the regular Tesla. Uh, I think it's just maybe the battery capacity they have, but I think the Cybertruck has enough capacity for that kind of stuff where you can offload, yeah. you know, you know, as a portable charger, your car is now a home size portable charger. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, the thing is, because I, I have solar panels, right? And during the daytime, obviously, my car gets charged up with, with solar panels. But then overnight, um, obviously, I'm still using electricity around the house. So even right now, it's nighttime here, all my lights and everything are being powered through the grid, right? Which um, obviously isn't ideal because uh, a lot of that is not going to be renewable energy. Whereas mm -hmm. if I did have this system, now I've not got battery, um, I've not got a battery system installed at my house, right? But if I did have, obviously, I would be very much not so reliant on the grid. So, so what are you waiting for, though? I mean, why no battery system in the house? So um, I kind of looked into it. I can't remember what I was, I think it was going to work out to be quite a bit. Um, uh, and based on the amount of sunlight we get here in the UK, <laughs> direct uh, sunlight, okay. yeah. it's just like, is it gonna be worth the investment of that? Whereas now, cause I've already got my car. If, it, if, if I can use that as a sort of, you know, as a battery store, should we say, yeah. why not? 
Um, so you guys don't have uh, incentives. I mean, I'm sure you, you do have you some do. incentives you for do. the solar panels. But. Yeah, again, I, I, I don't know the full details, but I think the last time we kind of looked into it with the government grants and stuff, it just wasn't like adding up in terms of um, how much, you know, uh, uh, how much energy I personally use overnight, basically. Let's put it that yeah. way, right? So No, no, basically. I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, I think this is, but this also could be a win for Tesla as well in mm. a very weird way. I mean, not in the sense that, because one thing I've always discussed with friends, I, you know, disclosure, I own Tesla stock. And one of my good friends, Sam, loves Tesla stock. And he bought it really early is because te- Tesla's the main, the main, Thing the company is trying to aim for, at least what he believes is the uh, energy grid, trying to create its own energy grid with other people, with you know, the solar panels, the power wall, and things like that. So, if you think about it this way, if if the F one fifty is success, successful in places like Texas, Arizona, people are like, yeah, you know, it's a truck. It looks and feels like a truck. Plus, it's electric. I'm saving. Like, I, I'm a hippie now, but I'm cool. You know, like I, I'm <laughs> not one of those. You know, it, it gives you that middle ground. Then in, you now go, if I can charge my house, you go, hmm, maybe I should get that Powerwall thing from Tesla, right? Mm. Because cause now, if I'm in Texas, I get sunlight all, all the time. <laughs> yeah. I, you know plenty. what I mean? Yeah. So I, I have a solar panel, I have battery storage, and my car is like the extra third storage if I want it, right? If I have mm. like two solar, solar power walls. So I think this is still a good thing for them, uh, but it's a good thing for the industry because now you're seeing just more electric cars, um, you see more variation in that market, and a lot of companies are, and, t- and speaking of which, today, Ford teased an electric uh, SUV, their first electric uh, SUV, the Explorer. I mean, they have the mm. Mustang E, but that was more like a, it's more of a specialty. The Explorer is their standard SUV that they sell. So it's going to be interesting I mean, to see what it does. EVs, obviously, they're, they're going to be the way forward. In the UK, we've already got a deadline for um, the ban of sales of combustion engine cars from 2030. So 2030 onwards, you're not going to be able to buy a brand new um, petrol or diesel car. It'll have to be an electric, right? So mm-hmm. I think the US is probably the only country that doesn't have a specific deadline as yet. But with the likes of this, and especially I know that pickup trucks and stuff are very popular in lots of areas of the US. Once we start getting more of these in, they'll be heading towards that target. Well, somewhat of a target much more uh, sooner than we thought. So it's it's awesome to see competition. I mean, I've got the Cybertruck on order. I'm not sure when it's going to come here in the UK. It's I'm I'm purely getting it for meme purposes. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's definitely nice to see lots more competition. And uh, hopefully, I mean, E, are you planning to cover some more EVs on your channel as as and when they start coming out? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely am. They are to me, it's more exciting now. Um, you know. Teslas are cool, but I did, there's some things I just didn't like interior wise. But I always like variation, and now that we've got we've got Ford coming out strong, we've got um, Hyundai, um, Hyundai also announced a new EV uh, mm. Mercedes, which you checked out. That looked absolutely awesome. The EQS, EQS, very sweet. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, we know BMW is working on some stuff. So like for me, that's, that's going to be kind of stuff I want to see. And I can't wait for, actually, I, I'm really excited to see what Toyota and Honda do because okay. those are the mass market EVs. Those are the EVs that, um, you know, everybody, like Toyota is the most popular car in, in the world, mm. you know. So once, once there is a Toyota Camry EV yeah. that is, you know, $30,000 or whatever, that's where you go. You know what? Yeah. Elect- uh, gas, it was cool having you around. It's time to move on. <laughs> See you later. Um, it's funny yeah. because there was there was some uh, um, there was some news that I, I mean people are tweeting this. I think it's just rumors right now. But um, uh, there's uh, for instance there's a uh, um, there's an article uh, about potentially Toyota partnering with Tesla. Do you think that's going to happen? Oh yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, so the funny thing is Toyota does a lot of partnerships. Uh, Toyota has par- partnered with Maz- Mazda. Um, I believe the Toyota partnered with BMW so they can have a BMW <coughs> engine in the Supra. Like they do all these things all the time. And Toyota is one of those companies where they know how to build a solid mass market vehicle. And I think that partnership goes both ways because I think Toyota is looking at it as in they're behind, mm-hmm. even though they had the Prius a long time ago. Yeah. Um, um, but they are behind in current electric tech. And if I'm Tesla, 
this is a company that does mass market better than any. The only other person that competes with them is uh, Volkswagen, right? Mm. So this is the company that does mass market. We need to learn from them because Tesla is also facing a lot of manufacturing issues and complaints in China with their launch in China as well. So mm. that's the kind of thing that, to me, that's a that's like a perfect harmony because that now tells everybody. If Toyota goes, Tesla, you're helping us with this. Everybody goes, okay, we need to get our electric engines like churning as fast as possible. Let's move. Yeah. No, it's yeah. it's a very interesting space in EVs. And it's actually been fun covering more EVs on the channel because it's, it's allowed a bit more variation. And it's also fun shooting cards. So hopefully we'll be having a lot more of it coming soon. And that's all we have time for in this episode. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. Please do drop suggestions for future topics on social media. We're in Super Seth Speaks on all platforms. Thanks for listening. This is Seth on Super Seth Speaks with my co-host. Thunder Eve on Border Work. And we'll see you next time.